it's September, which means it must be either the Paris or Frankfurt Motor Show. And the fact that we are in an enormous show hall means that it is the Frankfurt Show. It is the largest show on the European Motor Show calendar, more on which later. But for meantime, here are the cars you must see. Stay tuned. And let's begin with the Audi RS7, which is being shown here alongside its Audi RS6 sister model for the first time. And they're significant because if you come up with a two-car garage, everybody needs something like an RS6 or 7. Big, practical, spacious, and chuffing fast. Talking of fast, it has a twin turbocharged 4-litre V8 engine making 600 metric horsepower, 591 brake horsepower, which if you tick the Dynamic Plus Pack option, gives it a top speed of 100 and 89 miles an hour. Now the RS7 comes to the UK in January 2020 with the RS6 following in March. There are no prices yet but the last RS7 was 87,000 quid so you could expect a small increase on that. So do you think that BMW grills have been getting a little large recently? Well take a look at that one. It's on the new Concept 4 and it previews what the next generation BMW 4 Series, that's the second generation 4 Series, the Nth 3 Series Coupe effectively will look like when it arrives next year and also what the i4 will look like when that follows in 2021. Now the new grille is said to be reminiscent of the 328 grille from the 1930s and it shows that there will be a greater differentiation between 3 Series and 4 Series from here on, although the two will still be based on very similar architecture underneath. BMW says this car is kind of 85% production ready, so this is pretty much how the car should look when it arrives. At the moment, it is an exterior concept only, there are no visuals of the inside. But when this car arrives, you can imagine it will have the usual gamut of 2-litre to 3-litre petrol engines and 6-cylinder and 4-cylinder turbo diesels. Later on, there will be a plug-in hybrid too, and of course, there will be an M4. Porsche is expecting rather big things of the Taycan which you see behind me. It is its first all-electric car. It is a four-door car of similar size to a Panamera, but that doesn't really do justice to what is underneath this rather spectacular machine. I say spectacular, that's when you come to the statistics, which I have a lot of here, forgive me for reading off of the cheat sheet. It comes in turbo or turbo S form. Now, neither is actually turbocharged. They use permanent synchronous motors, which are more expensive, but lighter and more powerful and easier to get cooling into than asynchronous ones. There are two of them, and together in turbo form, this car makes 616 horsepower and 627 pounds foot of torque. But if you go for the turbo S, then you get 750 horsepower and 777 pounds foot of torque and a 0 to 60 time of 2.8 seconds. Now, that's something of its own, but what Porsche really claims makes the difference is the fact that its electric motors have a throttle response five times quicker than an internal combusted engine. Uh, it has traction control which operates 10 times faster than an internal combusted engine. And in turbo S form, this Taycan, despite having a 90 kilowatt hour battery which takes the weight to 2.2 tonnes, can lap the Nürburgring Nordschleife in the same time as a 997 GT3 911. That is very, very fast indeed. Now the range is about 260 to 280 miles depending on which version you go for. Now, Porsche says the Taycan offers a step change over what is possible today and there is loads of kit on this car. Air springs, it has active rear steer and interestingly it has the lowest centre of gravity of any Porsche on sale. And the Taycan has an 800 volt charging system which means it can be charged at up to 350 kilowatts. There are not many chargers like that in the UK, there are just two but there are more coming. It can be charged at up to sort of 50 to 150 kilowatts, which is a more standard fast charge thing as well. On the really fast charging, you can charge it loads in just 20 minutes, but it depends where you can find those charges. Anyway, it goes on sale in January next year in the UK for about £118,000 in turbo form, £136,000 as a Turbo S. Lamborghini likes making V12s. It doesn't really want to put turbochargers on them and it certainly doesn't want to stop. So its answer to make them more efficient is to mildly, very mildly, hybridise them. So behind me is the Shan. There will only be about 63 of them that are all sold at £3 million a pop. And the idea is it has a 6.5 litre Aventador SVJ engine whose power has been turned up to 774 horsepower from 659. Added to that is a 48 volt electric motor attached to the gearbox which makes another 30 odd horsepower bringing the total to 808 brake horsepower. 
Now the idea is that that motor will help it manoeuvre at low speeds and during reversing, but what it can also do is just torque fill at low speeds and also fill in the gap between gear shifts because this still runs that single clutch, slightly mechanical gearbox which ends in rather jolty gear changes if you're not careful. This softens that out, smooths those out, and it is kind of the future of Lamborghini's V12 engine. Now, by far and away, the biggest story here at Frankfurt is that there is a new Land Rover Defender replacing the icon that went off sale in 2016. Now, it no longer has a separate ladder chassis and body on top. It is a monocoque, as most new cars are. Land Rover says it is much, much stiffer this way and is the only way they could make it. It says it is 95% new, this platform that it is based on, although it does use existing other Land Rover architecture. And its ruggedness and capability are second to none, not just in Land Rover standards, but all standards, Land Rover says. Now, there are 90 and 110 badged versions. What that used to refer to was the wheelbase in inches, but it doesn't anymore, and there's a commercial version of each. Now, its off-road credentials are really spectacular. I have some of the numbers here referring to the approach and breakover angle on a three-door is almost 40 degrees on each. The ground clearance is some 291 millimetres. The wading depth is 900 millimetres. And it's quite capable as well. You can put 900 kilograms inside the car. You can put 300 kilograms on the roof. And depending on the version, it can tow up to three and a half tonnes. Of course, it is four-wheel drive as standard. You can have coil or air springs. There is a low ratio gearbox. The centre differential is lockable. You can have it with an active locking rear differential. Land Rover says it's the most capable car it has ever made. Now, there are more details on this. We've had a closer look on a video we've prepared elsewhere on our YouTube channel in advance. But know that this car will go on sale early next year from around £40,000 in 90 form and £45,000 in 110 form. Later still, there will be a 130, which gets an extension to the bodywork out of the rear of the long wheelbase version. There are a range of petrol and diesel engines for now, from 200 horsepower diesels up to 400 horsepower petrols. A plug-in hybrid will come later, but there won't be a full electric version. The story of Frankfurt is not quite so much about electrification as it was at the Geneva Motor Show earlier this year, but it is kind of the story here at the Mercedes-Benz stand. So we're going to start with the car you see behind me, which is the Vision EQS. So this EQS will go on sale in 2021. It is a luxury vehicle, so it will compete with the likes of Jaguar's next generation all-electric XJ, as well as the Tesla Model S and perhaps even the Porsche Taycan. It is on a bespoke electric platform, but it will be used for an even more luxurious Maybach version, which will compete with an all-electric Rolls-Royce, which is currently in development. But for here, it has two electric motors totaling 470 horsepower. It is four-wheel drive, and it does have the option of being charged on a 350 kilowatt fast charger, which is the kind of thing that can put 80% worth of juice into it within 20 minutes. Beneath it all, there is a 100 kilowatt hour battery giving the EQS a range of more than 400 miles. Now, away from the EQS, there is more stuff going on at Mercedes, but it is largely about electrification as well. There is a plug-in hybrid version of the A and B class, and aside from that, there is the ESF. Now, that is based on the new GLE, which also makes its uh, debut here at Frankfurt, but it features a lot of advanced safety systems, which Mercedes says will become more relevant in the years to come. As driver assistance and autonomous tech takes over, people will sit in different positions, so it is investigating retractable steering wheels, airbags that come out from different places, and that is shown also alongside the Smart EQ models. Now, Smart said last year that it was going to go fully electric and ditch its little three-cylinder petrol and diesel motors. It has finally done that, and the facelifted Smart EQ is the result of that. A Volkswagen would like you to forget Dieselgate, and it has a new logo to reinforce the point. And it thinks that its new ID3 is the car that is going to help you do it. Now, ID3 is called 3 because Volkswagen says it represents the third phase of Volkswagen's life. The first started with the Beetle, the second began with the Golf, and the ID3 is part 3 of its history. Now, it's significant to the extent that there are no internally combusted engines on Volkswagen stand. It is all ID3s or other ID concepts. Volkswagen says it will sell 3 million electric vehicles by 2025. So let's bear in mind that the noise is more important than the sales volumes because it will sell 6 million cars per year in the Volkswagen brand between now and then. So its EVs are still a fairly small portion of its overall car sales. But 
ID3 is based on a new MEB platform, which will underpin other electric vehicles, and Volkswagen is also going to license it, Ford is interested, to other manufacturers. So the breadth of MEB's reach will be quite broad overall. The ID3 is a family car, a little bit bigger than a Golf, but not very much. Volkswagen claims there's more space inside than a Golf, thanks to the practicality in packaging offered by having a large battery pack underneath the floor, and you'll be able to get an ID3 in two power outputs and three different battery sizes can be 148 or 200 horsepower with batteries ranging from 33 kilowatt hours through to 77 kilowatt hours so the range is anything from 200 to 340 miles and you can recharge it at either 100 or 120 kilowatt maximum depending on which version you go for so it goes on sale in the UK early next year we've already driven a prototype there's a video and a first of it elsewhere on this site and on our YouTube channel and it will go on sale at about 27 and a half thousand pounds and that's before the government tax rebate. So there's always room at a motor show for a wacky concept and the Audi AI Trail, although they seem to use the word I Trail, behind me is actually one of my favourite cars, if not my favourite car, of the show. It's the fourth in Audi's AI I concepts and the idea is that when or if car sharing takes off, these kind of preview what your car might be like. Now the thinking is, at the moment you have to have a car that does everything. But come, say, 2030, if you're sharing cars a lot more often, you can have a car that only does one thing. So the AI trail just goes off-road. So it's Audi's idea of what an SUV might look like come 2030. I don't think an SUV will look like this come 2030, but it is a really cool thing. It's not based on any other Audi platform, but it does use the battery from Volkswagen's MEB thing, and it also uses the powertrain from an Audi Porsche joint venture. So it's got 429 horsepower from four separate electric motors. So there aren't many things that will make it through to production, but there are a couple. At the moment, Audis have what they call a very high belt line. Now that's the point where the glass meets the door. The idea is on the AI trail that the glass comes down and then folds down beneath you as well. They call it a sort of invisible belt line, and it means that the cabin can be much more spacious, the window is much bigger, and visibility is much better. I quite like the idea of that. Also in the AI trail, the only infotainment system basically comes from your phone. Now I can see that becoming much more of a thing in future as well. I like it, won't go into production, but if an SUV does look like this in 2030, happy days. And those are Frankfurt's greatest hits. And if you're thinking to yourself, aren't there fewer manufacturers than usual? You would be absolutely right, because there are car makers such as Aston Martin, Bugatti, Ferrari, Fiat, Jeep, Kia, Nissan, Peugeot, Toyota, Volvo, Citroen, and more, who have decided to spend their marketing budget elsewhere than on a large-scale, expensive, static motor show. Such is the dilemma of the modern show that things like Goodwood or bespoke events have taken over. However, we hope you've enjoyed these and we think that the Geneva Motor Show will be one of the European motor shows which survives, if not even thrives. We'll be back there in March next year. And in between now and then, we've got videos at least every week, news, reviews, group tests, drag races, the works, the whole car porn malarkey. So if you like, subscribe, click the bell icon, you'll never miss one. Thank you very much for watching, really appreciate it, and we will see you very, very soon.